Our presentation, as you know, today is not just from the ground up. Historic preservation in the 21st century Georgia. Stephen has been a professional archaeologist for 25 years and has worked on sites throughout the Southeast, New York and Bermuda. He obtained his BA at New York University and his MA in Maritime Archaeology and History from East Carolina University. He is completing his Doctor of Philosophy in Archaeology from the University of Oxford, which is in the United Kingdom, um, on the archaeology of the historic Creek Indians of the Okmulgee River Valley. His primary area of specialization over the last two decades has been the prehistoric and historic sites of the Okmulgee, Oconee, and Flint River basins. His concern for these special places within his home region has led him to found the Middle Georgia Preservation Alliance, of which he serves as executive director. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you all so much for having me. I think if there is uh, one point that I'd like to get across today, it is that uh, historic preservation is not just about old houses and even other historic structures. It has to begin in the ground with the archaeology beneath those structures because all of the people that used uh, and built those structures, they left artifacts in the ground. So when we lose a historic structure, if something else is going to be built there, it's bulldozed away, uh, just knocked down. Um, we're losing more than just what you what you can see. We also have to think about what we cannot see. Uh, start off with this uh, this great short poem by uh, Shelley. Ozymandias, I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell me that its sculpture well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. <laughs> Historic preservation is often dealing with uh, ruins, um, there are many houses that look like ruins that can still be saved. Um, there are, as we said, artifacts that must be accounted for in the ground from all the periods of prehistory and history. So uh, I guess I wanted to uh, include that poem because it makes us think in a different way. It makes us think about the past um, a little more uh, deeply. There are some very um, influential people and inspiring people who have come before us in historic preservation. Richard Nichol of Chicago uh, was battling in the mid 20th century. So many examples, urban renewal. Um, and this happened in Georgia, as we all know. Uh, Macon, for instance, um, huge numbers of old uh, historic buildings downtown Macon were uh, wiped out in the name of urban renewal uh, in the 60s and 70s, buildings that we now wish we still had. Um, and it, it crops up again, urban renewal uh, is not a dead concept, uh, it's continually happening. Um, but Richard Nichols said, great architecture has two natural enemies, water and stupid men. I love that quote. In Georgia though, we have uh, seven, amazing women who really started preservation in Georgia. Uh, six are shown in this photo. Um, these are the magnificent seven ladies of Savannah. Savannah, as we know, it would not exist without them. They started the preservation movement in Savannah in the 1950s 
after uh, the city market was torn down. And then next was going to be uh, an amazing house built around 1820. And um, they stopped it and they started a movement. I don't think they meant to start a movement, but they inspired every preservation initiative that has come after them in the state of Georgia. We owe them a huge debt. When we talk about preservation and archaeology, what does your average archaeological site look like? Very few are mounds. Almost none of them can you even see above the ground. This is an example just this grass on, a gr on the ground of a National Register eligible historic uh, site in Houston County. Um, there's nothing to see there, right? But numerous projectile points from the Archaic period, the Woodland period, the Mississippian period, numerous types of pottery came out of the site, which made it such an important site. And um, we have to think about, again, what we cannot see. It's not just the buildings that we see that we need to preserve. Um, it's the archaeological sites uh, that are under the ground. Now, speaking of the archaeology, I'll go through pretty quickly um, some of the background, some of the things that um, we have to know and appreciate um, when we're trying to preserve archaeological sites. Um, most everybody knows about uh, the Bering Land Bridge and uh, until say 30 years ago, it was thought that all the people who came in the prehistoric era, their ancestors at least, came through during the Ice Age over the Bering Land Bridge. Well, archaeologists for the last 25 or 30 years have been finding sites that are beneath those layers in the stratigraphy of the Earth um, and it was they were occupied at a time before the Bering Land Bridge was available for crossing over. So how did these people get here? Boats, um, maritime routes from uh, mostly from Asia. There have been some theories about certain ones coming from Europe that are unproven. But what we do have are um, sites like Monteverdi in Chile, Cactus Hill in Virginia, Topper in South Carolina on the Savannah River and Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania, where there is good stratigraphy for showing uh, pre-Clovis activity. Younger archaeologists these days, and I guess I will say non-historic archaeologists like who are less than 50 years old, unlike myself, um, they have a little problem accept, accepting these dates. Uh, the older archaeologists um, still question uh, many of these, but it's like Thomas Kuhn wrote in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, basically, um, some people will never accept the new ideas. Uh, there are no sites from this period recorded in Georgia yet, uh, but there are several point specimens that have been identified that are similar to the ones from these sites, Meadowcroft and Cactus Hill in particular. Um, next, we get to the Paleo-Indian period. This is where things were thought to have started before we started finding uh, pre-Clovis artifacts. Um, and this is people who during the Ice Age were crossing Beringia across the land bridge, and they were nomadic hunters. They did not live in village lives, uh, and they made huge projectile points because they were hunting huge animals, uh, mammoths, mastodons, many other uh, smaller types of extinct megafauna. And we have uh, Clovis points, Simpson points, Dalton points. All of these examples that you see are from middle Georgia. Um, Jones and Bibb County, Upson County, one of them. Um, the Paleo Indians occupied most of the North American continent, including the Southeast, but it's really interesting in the fact that uh, more of these types of large points have been found in the Southeast than anywhere else in North America. They've been recorded and sent in to this Paleo Indian database of the Americas. And that has shown us there's a huge cluster of these types of points in the southeast. 
the Clovis name comes from Clovis, New Mexico in the southwest. So this is an interesting thing that's not been explained yet. We don't know why there are so many in the southeast yet. The archaic period. Um, this is begins at the very end of the Ice Age. So the megafauna are now extinct um, and their points begin to shrink in size. And uh, the earliest pottery also develops in all of North America. Um, in Georgia and South Carolina coasts, um, stretching down into Florida. Um, and that's fiber tempered pottery. Uh, this pottery is, is made from Spanish moss. The tempering agent is Spanish moss and grass. And uh, as I said, the point sizes begin to shrink in uh, size. And um, there's increasing sedentism. They're not completely living in villages yet, but they're kind of seasonally going back and forth to the same places that they've they found in their travels. And there's a, a, a lot more of these artifacts and these sites, especially towards the end of the archaic, the late archaic period than there were in the Paleo Indian. So they're hunting the same animals that we have today though. The deer, uh, bear, turkeys, all of these types of things, squirrels, rabbits. The woodland period is when in prehistory, people in North America began settling down into village life. Uh, and there's a, just a pottery explosion. There's all kinds of different types of pottery. It's usually sand tempered now. They're no longer so much using the fibers, the grasses. Um, lots of different designs. Georgia has a huge number of different types of uh pottery types from this period um and it's one of the things that in order to identify how important a site is uh, you have to be able to know what types of pottery you're getting um so you you find the the artifacts um or or someone brings them into you sometimes uh, and we uh do um archaeology day events and um People uh, sometimes bring their artifacts to be identified and we're able to then take a look at them and see what's coming from farms around middle Georgia. Last period of uh, prehistory before European contact happens is the Mississippian period. In fact, the Spanish come in during the tail end of this period and they meet these people living on these mounds. So when you think about um, Temple mounds. You think about places like Etowah and Okmulgee, Kolomoki. All these are sites in Georgia, publicly open sites that anybody can visit. And these were these people were very hierarchical. They were master farmers. Uh, they were living in large cities, though. Uh, there were about 2,000 people, they think, living at Okmulgee a thousand years ago, bigger than many cities in Europe at that time. And not to mention Cahokia up in uh, near St. Louis, which is the, the biggest one of all. Moundville in Alabama, the second largest Mississippian site, numerous mounds. Uh, these are the things that you can see above the ground. Um, but it's also, it's still what's in the ground. Um, so their distinctive pottery forms, they began using uh, shell as a tempering agent across middle Georgia, crushed shell. And this started up about uh, about a thousand years ago, and they were building these mounds adjacent to river floodplains. Um, it's called the Mississippian period because they were first found in such great numbers along the, the Mississippi River Valley. But so many river valleys across the southeast have these, these types of sites. When the Spanish came in in 1539, a little bit before that, but uh, De Soto's Entrada uh, was 1539 to 1943. Here you see a uh, configuration of what might have been De Soto's route uh, lined up with archaeological sites. Each of those little dots show an archaeological site uh, that has the right 1500s type of uh, artifacts coming from it. And here you begin to get written records. That's actually the definition of history. 
history is when people began to write things down. Uh, there were no written languages amongst the Native Americans living in Georgia uh, before this time. Um, so then you get European exploration and colonization coming after DeSoto. You get the establishment of St. Augustine, Jamestown, uh, Maryland, Charleston, which is the most important for our purposes here because traders spread out from Charleston going all over the Southeast trading with the uh, Native Americans and the French also in in Biloxi and Oglethorpe and his colonists in 1733 founding Savannah. More on the history and written records. Um, the differences between primary and secondary sources are crucial to this. Um, of course, a primary source is something someone has written down at the time. It's a contemporary account. It's an eyewitness account, and those are by far the most important. But then you get secondary sources like um, dissertations and theses and books and journal articles, which are also very important, and that's the interpretation of those. Um, those earlier accounts. Today we also have online archives, uh, which are amazing. I don't know if any of you have really dealt into what's online on the Library of Congress's web website, the Digital Library of Georgia, uh, the Georgia Historic Newspaper database, uh, the Georgia I archives here. Uh, I have found some pension, widow's pension records in my own family online thanks to the archivists here at the Georgia Archives. Uh, plats, maps, they're two different things actually. No such thing as a plat map. Um, online sources, I said, courthouse research, tax assessor records, probate court records. These are crucial in terms of looking into the lives of uh, the people who owned a particular property. If you're trying to save a house, who lived in the house, do they have a uh, their last will, excuse me, last will and testament um, available in the probate court office. Also, they'll often have, especially in the early 1800s and mid 1800s, they will also have uh, their um, tax assessor records and uh, estate appraisements. All of their property will be appraised and listed, and this includes their slaves. So some of the only places that names of enslaved people have survived is in the uh, probate court records, in the property records, uh, the appraisements of um, their owners. Let's talk about maps a little bit. Maps are like every other type of historic document. You have to interpret them. You can't just take them at face value. Um, what was the map maker trying to accomplish? Thomas Nairn, for instance, who drew this map in 1708 of the Southeast, and it shows the Okmulgee River Valley and some Indian towns in middle Georgia. Uh, the map is bigger than this. This is just a, a detail. Uh, but his purpose was British imperialism. He was claiming all of this land for Britain. There's another map that shows the same area that claims it for France. So what's the purpose of the map maker? Here's a very bare bones uh, map made by a Welshman that shows the um, central Georgia area. And uh, that's the Lower Creek trading path that you see going across there right through what is today Macon. Now then we get a little more detail on some of these maps like, like this one which is um, the Richard Beresford map of 1715. And this shows the uh, Creek and other towns living with the Creek uh, Indian tribes, um, living on the Okmulgee and Oconee rivers uh, in about 1715 with how many gunmen they had living in each of these towns. So looking at all of these maps, and this is Barnwell Hammerton map. This is my favorite one. This is so detailed and uh, it's got the trails, the uh, the Indian paths that the traders used shown on this map and distances between certain points. This can be found at uh, Yale University, by the way. It's, you can get it for free. Um, 
Speaking of the, uh, the Native Americans living in the historic era, so before Georgia is founded, but after South Carolina is founded. So between 1670 and and 70 and 1690 or so, um, there were many different Indian towns, and because of the the early settlers and colonists and explorers diseases from Europe, many of the Native Americans began to die off in vast numbers. Um, especially there were smallpox epidemics, particularly around the end of the 1600s. And uh, what happened was many of these tiny remnants of people began to gather together. And this is actually how our historic tribes were formed. Uh, there were no Creek or Cherokee or Choctaw or Chickasaw in the prehistoric era as we think of them today. Um, they began to form from many of these different remnants. Some spoke different languages, but uh, the Creek towns, the major Creek towns tended to have these things called square grounds, and that's what they looked like. Um, this was a place where meetings occurred, where visitors were greeted, important decisions were made. And again, you have a specific type of artifact that you need to look for. These look different than the artifacts that came before, so you can um, identify them and know that, ah, this is a Creek site. Ah, this is a Mississippian site. This is an archaic site. So these are just four different examples of pottery that have been found on um, a couple middle Georgia uh, sites associated with the historic Creek Indians. Now, one of the things that will exist on these type of sites are trade goods, which won't be found on prehistoric sites. So you see pipes, you see this uh, little thing on the far left, that's a little piece of sheet brass that's been fashioned into a, uh, a little necklace uh, ornament, and there would have been a whole bunch of those on this on a necklace. Lower left is a musket ball of the period. Uh, bells, uh, rifle parts, all sorts, sorts of trade goods. Now, what did the British uh, and Europeans get in exchange for trading these things? Well, they really wanted two things. They wanted deer skins which were taken across uh, to Europe and used to fashion all kinds of things, books, hats, um, all kinds of things. And just as much though, they wanted Indian slaves. We don't think a lot about um, slavery uh, in this era so much in the late 1600s and in 1700s involving Native Americans, but it was a very common thing and the tribes were decimated by this, this uh, trade in Indian slavery. Looking into uh, these types of towns, it's really important to study Indian trails and uh, trading paths and early roads. Um, so this is a map done for an article by John Goff, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of John Goff in Georgia history. He was a, uh, he, well, actually he wasn't a historian. I think he was an economist um, he worked at Emory, but the amount of material that he has here at the Georgia Archives is just staggering. Um, his investigations, he wrote the book Place Names of Georgia, uh, many articles in the Georgia Mineralogical Newsletter before that, and his work was just so painstaking and uh, so important, and you have to you have to look at it. You can't talk about any of these things, trading paths or what place names mean without referring to John Goff. <laughs> mm -hmm. G-O-F-F. Um, also the maritime history of uh, the Oconee, Okmulgee, and Flint rivers. There are still vessels uh, in the waters of all over Georgia, in every river, in major creek stream. Um, dugout canoes in particular. I recently looked at a dugout canoe uh, down at Georgia, Georgia Southern in one of their exhibits that was just fantastic that had uh, come from, I think the Oconee River Valley, was it? 
I believe uh, steamboats are another thing. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Pleasure craft, like the one, the little fishing thing that you see in the Oak Mogi at Macon right there. That looks nice, doesn't it? I think I need one. So what we do at the Middle Georgia Preservation Alliance is that uh, we try to document and preserve as many sites as possible within these 23 counties of Middle Georgia. We may expand later. I don't know, but right now we serve 23 counties, uh, Macon roughly being in the center, um, but all the way from Spalding County to Lawrence County, from Putnam County to Pulaski and Dooley and all in between. Some of the things that we work on in particular are cemeteries and um, trying to preserve cemeteries. Uh, there's so much information that can be learned from cemeteries that still hasn't been utilized by historians or archeologists. Uh, so that shows a ground penetrating radar machine, by the way, on a cemetery site in Houston County. This shows, the map shows uh, the number of unmarked graves, which are not filled in to the marked graves on another cemetery site in Bibb County. What else exists in middle Georgia? We've been studying grave markers and grave signers, and these are the people who literally carved their name in or stamped their names or, or the names of their companies into the stones. Um, and there is almost nothing published on this. Uh, mainly it's from New England and uh, New York State and in that region. Georgia, literally, I found really nothing that's even been published on this. And um, some of the types of, before I get into that, some of the types of grave markers, though, we'll talk about commercially made grave markers, and those are the ones that usually sign their names in them, uh, and folk grave markers. These were, you know, they were living on the frontier in, in many of these times. So you see grave shelters. There are a few of those still in existence. These used to be much more common. Uh, in fact, at that cemetery, um, there are some that are laying on the ground. There are little remnants of wood left, but these two were still standing uh, at Union Methodist Hayes Campground Churchyard in Taylor County, not far from Butler. Uh, in Thomaston, we have uh, the ceramic grave marker in Glenwood Cemetery. It's literally a piece of pottery that is marking someone's grave and probably made at a place called Jugtown on the uh, Pike County, Upson County line. Also in Upson County, you have these fascinating um, examples in the top right, what we're calling Southern Upland Folk Box Tombs. They're, they're kind of mimicking the uh, marble box tombs you may be familiar with. They're, they're a decoration on top of the grave. Nobody's actually buried in these, but the, this is made from local rock. And there are just numerous examples throughout Upson County and, and also Northwest Georgia. Um, we have handmade gravestones such as at the Brown Yawn Burial Ground um, in Dodge County. And some of the most fascinating um, because they have been thought to only be around Atlanta, but we have now identified hundreds of gravestones made by Eldrin Bailey of Atlanta, an African-American uh, stone carver. He flourished between, say, the 1940s and the 1980s. He's very well known in Atlanta. Uh, nobody knew that he had examples all over middle Georgia, even as far as Twiggs County, um, which is a long way. He was actually working for um, funeral homes in Atlanta, African-American funeral homes, and uh, he was, he was famous, he was well known. And these types of markers show, if you look at the top of it, it says Hanley, that's the name of the funeral home. It's not the name of the person. They always had the, that name on there, then the name of the person down below. So this one is in Memory Hill Cemetery in Milledgeville. Fascinating. We've actually, 
Walter did an article for the uh, Oakland Cemetery mm. about Mr. Bailey, but we've run into uh, graves as old as the late 20s. Really? Fantastic. And, and we've seen them to, uh, in the Cartersville area. I think they're much more widespread than than just around Atlanta. It makes sense. He, he was really working for Atlanta funeral homes uh, in every case that we found so far, but I wouldn't be surprised if just about every county in Georgia had some of these. I would not be surprised at all. Now, uh, as opposed to folk gravestones, let's talk about commercial grave markers. And these are basically the affluent uh, people of the 19th century. Um, these fancy uh, gravestones, so beautiful. They're works of art in, in and of themselves. Uh, for instance, um, one of the, the people that we've studied is the gravestone maker Lonitz out of New York. And we have uh, at least doubled the number that are known to have been uh, made for Georgia cemeteries over the last two years. Uh, but the signers of these, if you look at the bottom, this is what I'm talking about. Some of these are stamped in, some of these are carved in uh, by the gravestone maker. Uh, and Yeah, so we visited 230 cemeteries in the last year and a half and documented about a thousand signed granite and marble grave markers, um, documenting cemetery preservation practices, uh, the type of weed eater string that they use, if it's too thick uh, or if it's the tinier, the smaller ones are better, uh, the marker type, and this pie chart shows the top 15 gravestone carvers in our 23 counties in middle Georgia. So if you look, there are a lot of a lot of them that say our taupe. Our taupe is uh, was based in Macon um, and he was the preeminent um, antebellum gravestone maker and carver in uh, middle Georgia. His graves are found all over uh, in so many different cemeteries in unexpected places, uh, but you also have Muldoon and Company out of Louisville, Kentucky. There's quite a few of those. Uh, and the Zinc Monuments, uh, Monumental Bronze Company out of Connecticut. We've seen quite a few of those. Um, here's another breakdown of those by number. The former was by percentage. So you can see our taupe, our taupe, our taupe, our taupe, our taupe. They're signed differently. That's why we've classified them that way. Uh, TBR Tope was the son of the original JR Tope. On. Now I'll go rather quickly through some of the things, some of the uh, historic preservation successes, failures, opportunities, and challenges of the 23 counties in Middle Georgia that we deal with. Uh, Baldwin County is struggling with historic preservation right now. Um, there are a lot of problems. Baldwin County has a historic preservation commission, but um, they don't seem to be doing their job. Um, the old State Farm Prison, which was shown in this uh, postcard in the upper left, was demolished in 2018. Um, there was an effort, a preservation effort by local people to save it and the county went in and just demolished it before that effort could meet with them. Um, right now, the Zachariah Lamar House, who is one of the founders of Milledgeville, is under threat. Um, somebody wants to put a parking lot there. That house was built before the War of 1812. One thing that is good because it's on uh, private land and nobody's messing with it, is the Shinholzer Mound site. It's a middle Mississippian mound site, and it's underneath all that brush you see in front of those people in that photograph. That's also on the Oconee River in, in Baldwin County. Very important site. Continuing on a little bit about downtown Milledgeville. Um, we got involved with the effort to save the Zachariah Lamar House and we began to see that there had been a lot of houses that had been demolished just over the past 15 years in Milledgeville. 
like houses from pre-1850 that are suddenly gone in the last 10 years, usually for no good reason. Um, this map we created and it shows uh, the little explosions that you see show uh, historic structures and houses that are no longer there. Um, there are two colleges in Milledgeville. I won't mention them by name, but they bear a lot of the responsibility for this. I think our college towns um, are not stepping up in many cases in the way they need to be. Um, the others that you see, the little triangles, kind of yield signs, um, most of those are owned by one person who has a lot of different shell corporations that he owns them under, and he buys a house and guts the inside, keeps the outside largely, which is good. We're talking about houses from 1820, 1830, or before 1840, 1850 guts the inside and splits them up into student housing with four to six different people living on the inside. That's not a that's not a success story in historic preservation. Quite the opposite. Bibb County has had uh, many um, successes, but lately there's some definite problems going on. Um, what you see there on the top left was the Fallen Door Cemetery and it's no longer there. It was graded all the way around and then the graves were moved. Uh, Central City Park is a National Register eligible archaeological site and it's being impacted very dramatically by the parks, public park system of, of Macon right now. Let's move on to a success story that wasn't always a success, a success story. Uh, when they laid this railroad in the 1870s that you see on the bottom left, it impacted greatly the Lesser Temple Mound. Um, and they used to have motorcycle climbs in the 1920s and 30s on the Great Temple Mound at Oak Mulgee, uh, eroding things away. But the archaeology there that was done in the 30s and the, uh, the National Park uh, System has, has done wonders taking care of this incredible site, uh, Mississippian site, so much else, Clovis, a Clovis came from there, uh, one of the most important sites in, in middle Georgia, but not the only one. Fort Hawkins has had a wonderful resurgence, um, archeology span by the Lamar Institute, uh, found numerous, um, artifacts pertaining to the port fort period from 1806 to 1819. So War of 1812, this is a fantastic fort. Uh, there's massive collections of artifacts from the site. Steamboats in the Okmulgee River that are still there. Uh, 1854 explosion of the Charles Hartridge. Um, it's one of the most important things in Bleckley County that I'm aware of. Uh, Butts County, the William McIntosh House is a great success story. The Butts County Historical Society. Um, one of the main places to start, as uh, probably everybody knows, is your local historical society. These people are the front line of historic preservation. They know what's there um, and they often need help. Um, they need funds, uh, they need allies, and it's kind of what the Middle Georgia Preservation Alliance is about, to create an alliance between all of these different historical societies, many of which only operate within, you know, they're just about their particular county, but this is a regional effort. Uh, the, the picture you see in the lower part is actually an ancient Indian trail. That is the Oak Fusky Path, which is right outside of downtown Indian Springs or Flo Villa. And um, that is the path. That's what it looks like in that little section today. Desperate need of preservation. That's an opportunity, a challenge also, but there's a great opportunity to uh, save even a section. And that's probably 150 yards long, maybe, maybe not quite that much. 
Crawford County sites. You can't talk about Crawford County unless you talk about Benjamin Hawkins and the Creek Agency on the Flint River. Um, this is what's thought to be his uh, grave, his grave marker, the old Knoxville courthouse. Um, but we still have things happening that are not good uh, across middle Georgia and the whole state, I'm sure. Uh, the Blasting Game Cemetery in the lower left, uh, there was a, a marble box tomb and several others that were crushed by forestry activities and just left as is. Um, there seems to be no oversight, no activity to uh, repair this, uh, despite the efforts of the local historical society to, to suggest that the landowner help. Dodge County sites. There's so many opportunities in, in Dodge County. Um, old school downtown uh, businesses, um, I should have had in here the wonderful uh, mural that's in the post office uh, in Dodge County that sh shows the history of Dodge County, uh, known for its timbering and forestry activities. Also, Clovis points. So we're not just we're we're not just talking about what you can see above the ground, right? We're talking about what's in the ground or has recently come out of the ground because a farmer tilled it up and brought it into a, an Archaeology Day event. Um, Dooley County, the same. Houston County, I know more about because I spent uh, many years as the archaeologist at Robbins Air Force Base um, in another lifetime. Um, we've lost the Fagan Newberry House in 1966, sadly. It was built in about 1832 by, two, by one of the very prominent uh, people of the time. Um, National Register eligible archaeological sites, though, there are 16 of them on, on the base, as we call it. Um, also in Houston County is the Minshew Thomas Sullivan Cemetery, which uh, was a fascinating project because if you look at the tiniest square up there, the green square, that's how large they thought the cemetery was. Then later it was increased to add um, about an acre of land. Uh, so, uh, and that was done by looking in the courthouse records and there's a reference to the graveyard consisting of one acre. Um, we didn't know before then. So then we expanded our search and found more graves all because of going to the probate court office and looking at that. talk some about maps, but plats, I haven't mentioned. Here's Houston County 11th District plat. And this is when the first surveyors went into Houston County in about 1821. And uh, everything in middle Georgia is done on the land district and the land lot system. And they use 202 and a half acres every time, just about uh, for uh, as much as possible for uh, their plats and their land districts. So each of these squares you see is a land lot. Um, and the whole area is the land district. And there's the Okmulgee River off to the side. Some of these maps show Indian trails, which are very important because they were surveyed in in, in the early 1800s. And they're nowhere, sometimes they're not seen again on any other map or plat of the period. The importance of archival research. Jasper County, uh, that map that you see came from the National Archives in Washington, and it shows exactly where Sherman crossed the Okmulgee River in, between Jasper and Butts counties. Um, There are many mound, mound sites that you can see that you don't know it's a mound because it's so small. Jones County has some of those. Um, the one on the lower left is actually the Cedar Creek Mound in Cedar Creek WMA. It's way in the boonies. And um, the University of Georgia Field School excavated there some years ago. And that's mostly everything that we know about it other than that I think it's actually mentioned by Benjamin Hawkins.
one of the things that Jones County has a lot of are uh, cemeteries or, or plots in cemeteries that are completely enclosed by stones built by a stonemason. And these are locally sourced uh, stones. And a man named Jacob Hutchings, who was uh, a former slave, became uh, famous for his incredible stone uh, mason abilities. Uh, if you go to the courthouse in Gray, the stone that is around the courthouse was robbed out from the old courthouse in Clinton. And he, he dressed and created the stone uh, all from um, Jacob's Woods, uh, a place that's become named for him. Uh, and you can still see some of the marks of the tools and the rocks there. I recently attended a sacred harp singing. Some of you may know what that is. And it was at this uh, tiny primitive Baptist church in Lamar County. Um, and believe it or not, that's also something we're trying to preserve. Uh, sacred harp singing, which has been around in Georgia forever. Some would say it began in Georgia. The book, the sacred harp book that they used was first printed in 1844 in Georgia. Um, but now it is fading away in the Southeast and becoming more prominent all over the world. Go figure. Um, because of the movie Cold Mountain, apparently, uh, which features that type of singing. But um, it's a beautiful uh, type of uh, music. Dublin and Lawrence County has some uh, wonderful examples of um, box tombs. That's a box tomb that you see one side has fallen away. Now, th now this would be an easy, a fairly easy fix, right? There's an opportunity to fix the old city cemetery and pick up that one side that's fallen in and uh, attach those pieces together. Uh, as you can see the, from these box graves, no one is actually buried in them. That's an ornament that sits on top of the grave, a gravestone, they're actually in the ground. And they have recently restored this old hotel in downtown Dublin. Andersonville and, and Macon County have done some wonderful archaeological excavations and the things that they have learned about the prisoners kept there um, is fantastic. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in are old ferries and ferry locations. And the last ferry that was operated in Georgia was on the Flint River um, in Macon County. And uh, I think that picture was taken in the early 80s. I'll go through some of the rest of these fast. I think I'm running out of time. Uh, Monroe County sites, cemeteries, archaeology. Here's an old depot that is almost lost uh, in Monroe County, not far from uh, Crawford County. Uh, the old High Falls Bridge is gone, of course, from the uh, flood of 94. I walked across that bridge and fished from it many times. Um, soil maps. Very important. There's all kind of communities and houses and things shown on old soil, soil maps from 1913, 14, 15. You can't talk about Peach County without talking about what we call the Byron Pop Fest, but other people call the Second International Atlanta Pop Festival. Um, the Allman Brothers uh, and Jimi Hendrix played there. Um, one of his greatest concerts. This is an archaeological site. It has recently been given an archaeological site number by a colleague of mine who was there that those three days in 1970. I think that's great. They've been they've been doing excavations at Woodstock, for instance. What's the definition of a historic site according to the US federal government? A site that's 50 years or older. That makes me historic. Pulaski County, believe it or not, these dugout canoes used to sit in the rafters of the local funeral home for many years. The, their outbuilding where they stored their 
coffins, unused coffins. So far, unused coffins, I guess. Um, now they're uh, in another building, you know, better taken care of, but these dugout canoes were from the Mississippian period, over a thousand years old, pulled from the Okmulgee in the 1970s, I believe. Now also in Pulaski, we have documented um, a barge site, as you see on the lower right, um, about a hundred foot long barge site, about a hundred, uh, what's this about 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Lake Oconee in Putnam County and in that area covers hundreds of archeological sites uh, that were, some of which were excavated in the seventies before they put the water in. Um, one opportunity is the old Rockville School, which was kept as a museum for a while, but now has seen better days. Um, this was a school built around 1900 or so. Um, and the old, skill, old school history uh, museum is a great success story. It's one of the best success stories in middle Georgia. In fact, this was the Grammar and high school that everybody went to school in uh, public school in Putnam County before the 70s and it. It later had several other uh, tenants and was on its last legs when a group of local people stepped in to save it and. Made a made a community project out of it and um, it is now home to the local history museum. Also in Putnam County, you have Little Rock Eagle and the Rock Eagle Stone Effigy Mounds, which are interesting topics. Taylor County, we've done several bouts of excavations in Taylor County and magnetometer uh, investigations looking at Fort Lawrence and other locales there. There's a place called the Indian Fort that John Goff mentioned in his book, and uh, we did a metal detection survey there. Uh, believe it or not, the, the top central photo is on top of the Hartley Posey Mound. It's one of the biggest mounds in middle Georgia, and it's in Taylor County on the Flint River, and uh, it's, it's owned by a, a local family. Um, I'd love to see things like this uh, you know, properly preserved. Um, also the Masonic Lodge, the old jail. Twiggs County Old Richland Church is a great success story. Um, it has not had regular church services, I think since about the 1920s or 30s, but uh, the organization of people who are the descendants of those original uh, church members have preserved this church and it's very close to I-16 actually um, in Twiggs County. Um, also the Bullard Mounds are in Twiggs County, which not a lot of people know about, but these were house mounds. There are about 23 or 24 of them. And um, they are owned by a timber company, on land owned by a timber company who, who basically just for the most part, leaves them alone. They don't cut around these mounds because they're aware of them. Uh, but the hunting club that leases the uh, the property sometimes impacts the size the sides of these little mounds, as you see in the lower right. That's a um, a bulldozer has impacted a mound built in the 1600s, maybe 1500s um, there. Upson County, the archives were where, where Penny, where I met Penny. Um, fascinating that they have a 52 caliber Spencer carbine pulled out of the Flint River at Double Bridges, still loaded, fully loaded, seven, seven cartridges. And the way that they found out that it's still loaded is they took it to the local hospital and had it x-rayed. That's fantastic. Things you can do in small towns uh, that um, are just wonderful that sometimes, you know, bigger cities wouldn't allow or something, right? Um, the, Oak Chump uh, the Oak Chumpke Creek covered bridge is the only covered bridge left in middle Georgia. There's about 16 in Georgia. 
Um, and this is my favorite. My, my father's from Thomaston and um, I've been there off and on my whole life for picnics. And uh, so that is uh, it was it's actually restored, though, because after the flood of 94 washed it away, um, Arnold Grayton and Associates from New England was brought in covered bridge repairers and restorers and builders, and they dragged it back into place. They were able to keep about 30% of it, then dragged it back into place and uh, rebuilt the bridge according to the techniques of the 1800s. Wonderful. Sadly, the old mill that you see here in a painting is no longer there. Um, I thought that would have made great loft apartments, um, but Macon has done some of the same thing with its old cotton mills. Columbus has done wonders in Augusta. Just some artifacts, some of the artifacts we found in uh, Upson County or that have been brought in to me to, to look at. Those are two crystal quartz Clovis points. That's like extremely rare, beautiful. Wilkinson County, and I'm almost done. Um, there's an old jail that was later used as a fire department building, firehouse. And there's some of the grates from the jail. Uh, they've restored the old depot. That's where the Wilkinson County Historical Society meets. Um, if you want to know something about Wilkinson County, talk to those folks. Um, they've recorded just as many cemeteries. They've published a book about it. Um, so when you start researching, a lot of these the county historical societies have not only the county history book, usually published in the 30s, but there might be a follow up 50 years later and um, packed full of information. The Jones County one is just amazing. Um, and they meet at the old depot there, the Wilkinson folks, and they've been working on saving Balls Ferry, which is where a uh, skirmish took place in 1864. Just to reiterate the 23 counties that we uh, that we work in. And I'd like to thank uh, these folks. Particularly Ashley Quinn, uh, who is the president of our local archaeological society and who um, is uh, my partner in crime with the uh, Middle Georgia Preservation Alliance too. Um, And this is the last slide. So uh, if you need to get in touch with us or or support us in any way, we would appreciate it. Uh, we do archaeological survey testing and evaluation, historic preservation consultation, cemetery delineation, and historical research. Thank you. There are some um, some alliances, but they're they're basically not regional like this. Uh, most of them are like I think in Savannah, there's one that might cover a couple of the counties that uh, Metropolitan Savannah covers. But uh, this is it's a big area to cover, right? It's it's like a I don't know 100 miles north south, 100 miles east west, maybe I guess more than that, maybe. Um, but um, it's a great idea, I think. Uh, I think that bringing the local historical societies together and not just them, but the, the pre people that care about preservation that are maybe not a member of the historical society, um, a regional approach sees the big picture better. So, you know, you see the similar types of 19th century houses. You see lots of lots of documents once you learn to decipher that old script you know looking in probate court records um you'll see the same thing in in all of these counties i think it it's going to be on the Georgia Archives YouTube channel, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
It's not, but um, it could be in the future. <laughs> right? It's. Uh, I'm actually going to Hancock next month to look at some stuff, so it, it may be part of it in the future. Um, but right now we're concentrating on these 23. We've got our hands full, but there's some fascinating stuff in in Hancock County. For instance, those. I don't know if you know about those octagonal uh, structures that are in the woods near. Uh, I can't think of the name of the creek right now, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Rick Jocelyn of the local, the Hancock Historical Society and his wife, uh, Mariel, they know all about those. So uh, yeah, and they're actually related to, um, they think that's where a planter or several planters, they used to have several of these buildings, uh, kept their food stuffs and things for the enslaved people that they had on their plantations and these these structures are some still standing, like some walls are still standing, some have fallen, but they were octagonal, which is really interesting and strange. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Why don't you give us a couple examples of preservation efforts that you are now in the collaboration you're making with other agencies like the Trust for Public Lands or any any other group in what process are you going through? Well, give us a couple of examples of things you're working on right now. With with um, agencies and, and things. Well, like the well, one of the first things you have to do is acquire land, right? Right. <laughs> Or, or preserve the land, or restrict the land in some way, or hold it in trust for something to be done with. Right. Um, that that is kind of well. That is something that we have thought about ourselves. You know, with the MGPA in terms of acquiring land, but that's something for the future. We're not uh, that well funded yet. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah. A, a good example is Jim D'Angelo and what he's done at, at right Fort Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, that's fantastic. So working with the county, with other the local historic, the local archaeological society, the local historical society, and right? Now it's, it's turned into an essentially an archaeological park. It is. It's fantastic, and it's actually um, that and Fort Hawkins are like sister sites, and there's been this huge archaeological dig at Fort Hawkins, but uh, I'm so enamored of what they've done at. at Fort Daniel uh, because um, they have these open houses right about every month or something where people can go there and it's in Gwinnett County if anybody's wondering uh, it was a war of 1812 era fort built in 1813 and there's just a huge amount of information that has been found out about that site. Uh, we we do work with uh, yeah. the local historical yeah. societies and individuals. And just don't stick with one group that just have one school right. group. He worked with multiple schools, universities, and everything in it. So I said they come in for field school projects. They come in to work. They find things, all at lower costs than what you could do. Right. I have a professional right. Come in. Right. Right. By volunteers. I wonder why more of that doesn't go on. I've worked with volunteers a lot through the the years and they are great and indispensable but somewhat unreliable sometimes um, when you have to get something done and you're hoping that 10 people show up and five people show up or maybe 35 people show up and you get a lot of work done right it's just you can't always predict uh and that's the that's the one drawback but you have to work with volunteers yeah in this in this day and age uh it's it's actually crucial on especially with um from the ground up kind of organizations grassroots organizations like this is that's a good question i'm not sure if uh, they really know but uh they have been documented in uh, throughout britain and um especially in england and wales 
and amongst the uh, Cherokee and Creek in Oklahoma, interestingly enough. Um, there's there's often a gravestone inside there, so there there is usually a stone. Um, but um, I need to do more research on them, don't I? Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I do. They show a lot about cemeteries. I mean, that's one of the features. We have cemetery specialists here. And I just wondered, you showed some of those tombs, like for example, the the box tomb there, that was the upcountry box tombs. Some of these graves are, sh are shell covered. Now, there's not a whole lot of them a lot of time, but some, some cemeteries have quite a few of them. But I just wanted to, what the origins are, and obviously they're not all Native American, but I wonder some have a Native American influence. The shell, the, the shell covered graves, that's really associated with African American cemeteries in yeah. particular, R rural ones especially, but not just. I've seen them in Macon. Yeah, but just about every time you can find one, does, it, now, does, that, does that just mean that was kind of as as the area was colonized, it became kind of a universal custom among early early settlers and churches sometimes to use these shells for whatever various reasons. Are are actual or actually a lot of them really uh, Native American influence? I haven't actually seen Native American graves with shell on them, um, so um, I, I think it's more associated with the historic, you know, time period. And uh, it, I think they did become more prominent and kind of popular, especially in rural cemeteries uh, in earlier days, but especially in African American cemeteries. And, and it seems to have a, a particular meeting. Uh, they see these Native American sites, and so they had kind of adopt the custom. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think there is some literature out there on it, but the interpretation tends to be about the symbolic uses of the shells of Native, not Native Americans, but African Americans. Yeah, does there seem to be one particular shell, kind of shell? That has conch, conch shells, big, big ones, the conch shells. Um, the big bivalves. Stuck in the ground, but surrounding a grave. Five They don't seem to be shells that are indigenous to the area. Right. right. They look like they come from the coast. Yep, they do. They look like more like um, scallop shells. Mm -hmm. For example, see a lot of scallop shells. It looks like scallops. this could have been collected, but they could have also been bought in roadside stands in Florida and coastal Georgia. You know, they used to sell shells by the thousands like that. So, uh, just an idea. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. That's my appreciation. Thank you. Managing Georgia. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, thank you everybody for coming. September, our luncheon and presentation is My First Footsteps of Freedom by author and tour guide Brad Crennan. Brad will talk about the undercooks in Sherman's army. These are men of African descent, who became stretcher bearers during the campaign from Chattanooga to the end of the war. Now, including in, the, in this story, a man who were enslaved in Georgia and enlisted in the Union Army as Sherman moved his army through Georgia. Once again, thank you for coming and we hope to see you again soon. And thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Penny.